morning, good morning, Sir Martin. What's up? Another day in paradise, we would say. February 6th, 2023. Today, if all is well, our king, our queen, and our princess in the making of a queen will be arriving on St. Martin. I want to wish them a warm welcome to our shores and I hope they see what the country is all about. There are a lot of things planned. I saw a schedule, let me grab it there. Today they will be visiting the airport terminal, the reconstruction. They will be doing a reenactment of disaster. They'll visit the medical center. They'll have an uh, introductory lunch with the Council of Ministers. They will have the Phillipsburg Art Walk and the Youth Cultural Business Manifestation and Concert on the Boardwalk around 5.20 this afternoon. And on Tuesday, they will be doing a bird tour at Fort Amsterdam. They'll have an introductory meeting with the Youth Parliament, a visit to the White and Yellow Cross in St. John's, the Science Fair Nature on the Threat uh, Youth Perspective, they have the Agriculture Sustainability Nature Nurtury Project in St. John's, I understood. They will be planting the yellow sage at the Emilio Wilson Park. They will visit the St. Peter's Hill to look at the Ureda. They will have the Community Resilience and Enactment. And they will see a baseball match between MPC and the St. Martin Academy starting at 4 o'clock. That is the program that the royal family will do in St. Martin. I will speak about the visit a little later on down in the program, but for now, let me just go through my notices. I believe it is only fair that I um, continue my notifications with an apology to NVGB. As I stated last week that with a ruptured fuel line that the oil leaked towards the beach or spilled towards the beach. I was called by someone I have utmost respect for and I know his knowledge and his integrity are, in my opinion, impeccable, Mr. Jerome Chittick. And he informed me that no, Urban Camper, yes, there was a rupture. Yes, the oil spilled, but it spilled into the waste pits and that went into the recycling of the waste oil and the oil never reached the beach. So I want to apologize to GB because I did put the news outside that it might have happened and I had asked Nature Foundation to go and look but I got confirmation that it did not happen so I want to apologize publicly since I made the statement publicly. Nothing wrong with saying you're wrong when you are told you're wrong and shown you're wrong. Let's move on. So I did a little more investigating re uh, research on what was going down from um, this whole new concrete plant. I told you all about this new concrete plant coming around the zoo. So I continue doing a little more investigative reports. I notice a lot of people love to run, go cadaster and see what's going on. What I wanted to know was, I, I know who the land was given to. It was given to a local in Long Lease. That the local is family to the minister is not relevant at this point in time. But what is relevant is that there is a sublease. Now that sublease is not regulated no place. The, the law, as I know it, doesn't just allow you to sublet. That's what I went to courts for in 2010. And today, in 2030, 23, sorry, 13 years later, the appellate court can still not answer if selling economical rights is legal or not. If subletting is allowed through economical rights. So I just need to understand how that happened. Because that's the, the clarity I'm seeking here. That, that this government don't protect its own, that's crystal clear. That we know. I ain't going to worry whine about that anymore. That they prefer to see Samantha Concrete with a few hundred employees, Central Mix and Bobsy send home their people so they could bring in their own little French connection of the Simbats. I understand that. I cool with that. Not that it's good for this country, but this government has never worked for this country. So let us not cry over spilled milk on that one. But at the end of the day, I do hope 
that we can get clarity on how to subletting went down. But as a card, it means something illegal went down there. So I noticed we have different types of undocumented people in Samaritan and that they have different sets of rights. You must remember the immigration department has their job to do and that is to pick up the undocumented people on this island and have them deported. At this point in time, this is a six month program, a pilot project between the VSA and the Ministry of Justice where they said all undocumented workers that have worked for, I think it was three years or five years um, already, the business owners should come in and register them and if they meet the criteria, they will get a work permit and if need be, a residence permit. But if they don't meet it, they will be deported. That is one group. Then you have group two. Group two is the group that falls under the World Bank. And why do I bring it up? Because they are not subject to the immigration laws of the country. They are subjected to a policy of the World Bank where the World Bank states that once they start a project, they don't look at legality. They only look at the human being. That, that is something also that big organizations like the Red Cross does. And I understand for the Red Cross. I understand that one. But for the World Bank, I do not understand it. And I'll tell you why. It isn't as if the World Bank is opening their cash pan and saying, I am distributing monies to you that I picked up on behalf of you all from citizens of the world, like the Red Cross does. The World Bank distributes monies that they got from a donor. And in this case, that donor is our kingdom partner, the sovereign country of the Netherlands. So I have a fundamental problem that our partner in the kingdom is allowing our immigration laws to be trampled on. And then you come talk that I got to come down here and help you with border protection. You're not protecting my borders. You are telling me that I cannot deport certain people anymore because they fall under the umbrella of the World Bank. And that is wrong. Look, that some people wanted money and they signed away. The rights of this country, they should be dealt with accordingly. They should be dealt with accordingly. But you cannot put the country to suffer by allowing this to happen. I really would want to know who will challenge this in courts as this is a direct form of discrimination. And to the prosecutor's office, you say crime don't pay, right? I want you to look at this situation where illegal people, undocumented, or even documented, because the government said 90% is documented, which is BS. But okay, 10% is not documented. Monies are going to be given to people living in Santo Domingo, haven't paid a day's a day tax in this country, have been bleeding this country for 50 plus thousand dollars a month, have been doing it for over 10 years. We can assess all we want, but we can't touch them. Crime does pay. Because the World Bank finds it fit to go and pay all these people and says that's their policy. But crimes are being committed towards the country. Some parliamentarians feel that, oh, yeah, we were not, um, we didn't stop it and we allowed the human rights to be trampled on. Well, what the nonsense you're talking about? That, that, that people were living in substandard conditions, not only on the landfill. Go all throughout the island, you're going to find it. How come they ain't given those money? You see, this is my problem. We, we don't judge people by the same stick. Depending on what it is and whom it is, we judge people differently. That 
is a problem. And the courts is just as bad as those in government. Because the courts also judge people on whom they are. Not what they did, but whom they are. So they can set examples, they say. But you're not setting examples when you yourself are doing it wrong. You're showing the people in the country how corrupt you all are. That's what we are doing. That's the problem we have in this country. And I'll delve into it a little later when I talk about the budget. Because a lot of things happened with budget 2023. And things are going totally out of par. But let's move on. I noticed the Bamboo Power Ranger team of politicians and ex-politicians are gearing up to make a strong bid for the next election. While I love competition, I want to see how this one's going to play out because it's going to blow up before it starts. Nevertheless, welcome to the Power Rangers team. I noticed they have a new set of uh, cheerleaders and uh, like um, M um, MP to be uh, the the bid that the MP is, the, 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 the gentleman is making, someone I, I, I consider a friend, Gromico, I think he has been exposing people for crazy. And I think at the end of the day, that's a good thing for the country. Country needs to know what we're dealing with. We talk about integrity, but we don't always preach integrity or we don't always practice integrity. We like to talk about it. Now, we're back to LNG usage for power supplying and eventual eventually the takeover of GB because you can't see them separate. The minister spoke about an LNG refueling farm. But why are you going to have a refueling farm if you don't have a production center? Bring a fuel here and GB is presently not using it makes no sense. So you're going to have to put on some engines someplace. Now, I, was, I chaired a meeting in parliament where I saw such a proposal made. And that proposal was to run a new production plant in St. Martin based on LNG. Siemens and all of them attended this meeting. This was a genuine presentation made by a group in St. Martin. The thing is this, GB still has huge depths to handle and bringing in another player at this point in time would mean that somebody can take over all GB's debts and all GB's employees if they are going to run this new plant. I am all for a plug-in for the cruise ships. I am all for it. Most of the cruise ships are also turning over already to LNG gas. They are building their engines to run an LNG gas instead of diesel. And that would mean that environmentally, you ain't changing nothing. Don't talk about environmentally when you don't understand what it means. Because that's what's happening when they put out these pretty stories. Had the minister said, I truly want to do something for the cruise industry to drop the carbon footprint because cruise ships have a very high carbon footprint and we have about 700 to 770 a year jacks up our carbon footprint just like all the aircrafts landing at PGIAE. So had he said let us put a windmill pack together or let us put a solar pack together to create a plug-in for the cruise ships, I'd have said bravo. Well done, Minister. Because whomever was willing to put money into the LNG, if it was the FCCA, as I'm understanding, they would have also put it into the solar. Because for them, all they're looking for is the plug-in. To drop the carbon footprint that the cruise industry has to pay for to international um, groups because they are charged for it. Then as if it's for free, nothing for free in this world. So again, I am saying LNG is a trans 
information to alternative energy. But right now, because we haven't done anything on alternative energy for the past 13 years since we became country, if we are going to start, start now. Do it now. We don't need to wait another three, four years. We can do it now. Because for LNG, you gotta go build all the storage tanks. So somebody get the lucrative contract on the side again. While if we come in once and for all with the solar panel and GB can be instrumental in this, where GB takes that power and puts it on their grids. GB can even buy storage batteries if need be and work its way into the alternative energies platform. Sure, there's going to be some reschooling, but I prefer we reschool our own and we bring in others again to do it for us. This is what we need to understand. We talk about capacity building, but if we don't build our own capacity, then let's stop talking about it because we are lying to ourselves. So again, I don't see Shell, Sol today, rolling over, play dead, leaving another distributor coming to St. Martin with LNG gas. So we're gonna have a serious war then. And then, you know who pays the price? The residents of St. Martin. We're screaming about the fuel clause, but we are doing absolutely nothing about it. Because the LNG gas was not to help GB. It was for a plug-in for the cruise ships. You see what I mean? It's not about us. It's about them. We need to change that mentality. It is about us. And we need to take care of us. And if we don't do that, we're going to have a bigger problem as the years pass by. If we want to honestly keep cruise ships in port to ensure that some people can go at night and have a dinner on the boardwalk, or maybe in one of the restaurants in Simpson Bay or in Phillipsburg or in Grand Cars, wherever it may be. It would mean that the ships will have to stay in port after 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock. 80% of the ships, at least, have a very close port of call and they go out in international waters and they drift there for 5-6 hours and then they go to be it St. Kitts, be it Antigua, be it Tortola, be it uh, Puerto Rico, one of those islands. Or St. Thomas, one of those islands. If we allow them to open their shops and their casinos on board, it isn't as if we are going on board to play in the casinos. To the contrary, their people can now go in there and make money. And the casinos is a serious business for the cruise ships. It's a money-making business for the cruise ships. And since they can't open in port, they leave port. They leave. I think it would be nice to check what happens in the Bahamas, where the ships stay all night. And the casino is wrinkling on board. Because they adjust their laws to suit their economy. We, on the other hand, we keep them shut to keep the local casinos that are not helping this economy stay afloat. I will be addressing all the standalone casinos in the very near future because I sincerely believe we have too much and we have pull a in some place. We have more gambling addicts in this country than anything else. That's a serious problem. But let's move on because that's not a discussion for today. I noticed the WITU Union representing the teachers and some civil servants is once again at loggerheads with the government. And it's, they are stating that the government is not acting in good faith and the letter that was sent to the civil servants was not a letter based on um, realities and they really want the letter retracted and discussions to be held. I hope that both parties can find themselves and that we don't have unnecessary industrial actions once again. But again, 
the Wixu PSV, PSU, sorry, they also started voicing their opinion and saying, listen, we have a lot of COLA outstanding, cost of living adjustments outstanding. And while we understand the financial situation is not up to par on the island, we would still like to start having a discussion when we're going to get our money. And in the Herald today, there's a whole listing of how much, how, how much percent it is. And I think it's close to eight or nine percent. And the repayments would have been three percent one year, three percent the next year, two percent the last year, I think. So eight percent cost of living to be adjusted. And naturally, the first of January, everybody would get back their increments as on the 31st of December, the, um, the thing was lifted, the uh, 12 and a half percent law was lifted so everybody will be getting that increment starting the first of january if they had a positive evaluation um bush road no i i don't know what to say i started working on bush road for days and in the past i used to pick up the phone and i used to call the minister i used to sometimes call his staff in the ministry and give some advice i stopped doing it because I get the impression that they believe I am trying to upstage them or make them look foolish. I don't need to do that. They do that to themselves. They're, they're, they're versed in that. And I'm going to show you a few examples as we go along in this show. But Bush Road is a place known for water. And there are few people that left. Lois left and I left. And yeah, both of us knew it. But there are more people in Vromi that know of this in infrastructure management and in new works. But none of these people are being asked anything. They're putting them in twilight zone because they are busy building a new paradise for themselves. Bush Road is now a clear example of when you play with fire that you get burned. They thought they were going to have smooth sailing and smooth riding. Well, they bounced up on water. They didn't know what to do with it. So what it did is they just threw in base course and press that and Bush Road has been left unattended and unfixed qua asphalt. And the pieces that they did fix, they didn't even drop road markings on it. So, but I'm extremely happy that this happened because I had a big problem with that program I just read out to you with the King's visit. Because we come here and we do and we have all these things but I'm going to deal with that just now in the King's visit. The roads are in a deplorable condition. I have a very serious problem when the Prime Minister comes out and says, Oh no, but all the cleaning works and all the road works are in normal part of the yearly budget. So why you didn't fix them last year? What happened to that budget? Why you haven't been cleaning last year? You conveniently clean up because a king coming. The hypocrisy, you must leave it for yourself. You don't have to share it to the public. We are tired of it. I live in St. John's. There are two visits of the king in St. John's. And they clean where he's going. The rest of St. John's just looking on. So please, Madam Prime Minister, keep your lies to yourself. We don't need them. We hear them daily. What a joke. Let me give you something positive. Who went to the auditorium Sunday gone there? I couldn't make it, but I, I'm promising to go this Sunday. I know I got Super Bowl to go out to after, but I want to go and support the youngsters, the young schools, all the schools, the young um, primary schools. They're playing netball. I don't understand the game too good, but I go in there to support them because I believe our youngsters need a little pro. They, we we got to show them that we appreciate them doing sports and all the schools um, have made a good attempt to get their kids on the right track. And I, I believe that's something that needs supporting. I'll be there just having some fun looking at one of my grandchildren also playing that ball. So let's, let's, let's go there. Sunday coming out. I think for the kiddos it's a dollar. For adults it's two dollars. And I think we all go there. We're going to have a great time enjoying that ball from the youngsters. Well, it looks like we're getting a little rain here now, so let's hope all those who are walking around the high suits now don't get a soak down. The visit of our king, our queen, and princess. In my eyes, it's a real carnival. When I look at how the visit went on the other islands, and I'm talking now Aruba, 
Curacao, a bonnet, they did those. I realized in Aruba, I was extremely taken aback by what happened. I enjoy them dancing in the streets with the people in costumes. They're not mannequins. They're human beings. The royal family, they're human beings. So I am all open that these things happen. But again, in Aruba, at the University of Aruba, I think in the Ola, there was a lecture. And while the lecture was ongoing, uh, a master law student, uh, Mrs. Santiago, got up and started to speak while the lecture was ongoing. And she was basically protesting that the king, the royal family, did not apologize for slavery. Now, again, this is a, this is a discussion that we can have all day here today. Should the royal family apologize or should they not apologize? Because the Dutch government did apologize. And why should the royal family then apologize? It all depends on which side of the fence you sit that you are going to go with it. The Prime Minister said they're not talking about it. There's no need to ask the King, His Excellency, if he will apologize. I find it very unfortunate. Personally, I would have hoped that the King had apologized before he came here. So there wasn't, wouldn't have been this big discussion about an apology. And why do I say that I believe it would have been a good thing that he had done it? For the simple fact that he himself has acknowledged that the House of Orange that he represents had a role in the transatlantic slave trade. And he has now given an instruction to have a study done by Professor Oost Indy and a few more experts to see how deep they were involved in the slave trade as the House of Orange, basically through the West Indies Company. So you know that there was an involvement. By saying, I apologize for whatever my forefathers did in the slave trade, would have shown a different side of the royal family. He, at this point in time, opted not to, and I will respect that, but I find it very regrettable because it, it keeps the discussion of slavery on the forefront while we should now start talking, and what now? That it happened, we all know. The history books have that in it. But what happens now? Where do we go from here now? How do we fix it for our country now? And a lot of people want to talk about money. And yes, money will do some things. But money will not do everything. And the question is, where do we want to put the money? We want to put it in the education of the people, the health of the people, the rebuilding of certain historical values of this country. Those are the type of things that Maybe I will be part of a discussion. But to give families money and say that I'm going to give this great, great, great grandson of a slave 10,000 euros, that's utter nonsense. That should not be the discussion. And I hope it's not. But again, we need to understand that that piece has created the setting for what happened in Aruba. I noticed Van Hoffelen has a very loose waist, so I believe she got some Spanish blood in her, because the way she was dancing was not truly Dutch. She, she's like the, the queen. They got Spanish blood. They can dance. I noticed that one. So again, I think it was unfortunate what happened in Aruba, and in Curacao it was a little different. But again, my thing is this. While the royal family comes to the country, why is it that we, we, um, we don't look at things that maybe they can have an impact on? I am sure the king has an impact on monumental care. I think culture, heritage, are things that are not politically the job 
of the Dutch, but the king can push it a little bit, or the princess or the queen can push it a little bit to help us. Because let me publicly state this. It's a shame that our museum, the St. Martin Museum, is put on in a little shopping center down there in the Spatian's Arcade. That's where it is, between a bunch of little shops selling t-shirts and all kind of things. While the courthouse, the most recognized building in St. Martin, functions as a place to parade criminals through Front Street and the side alleys so the tourists can take pictures and we can put it all on Facebook. Instead of making that the National Museum of St. Martin. I had hoped that the king would have wanted to see that, to see our museum state, to see the state of Seamark. Not only the good, the feel good stories, but the true problems we have with those type of things. Because that's not being shown, that's not being discussed, and that's unfortunate. So while I have no issue with their visit, I think we missed a golden opportunity to bring certain things to the forefront and say, Your Highness, this is what we need help with. We need you to maybe work with the Prince Bernard funds, make that extra call for us, because our people can't get to them. And make sure that we can build a new courthouse or help Samantha build a new courthouse with their justice wing on Pawn Island, where we got enough land, and take that building and make it a museum. A museum St. Martin can use, a place where tourists can walk in all day, and the clocks in the building, because we have a beautiful clock system in that building that we don't use, can play the music that it was built to play. Because when it was the post office, that's what it did. And from the day we made it the courthouse, we shut everything down. You see, we talk about preserve on this side. But on this side, we don't. We forgot it already. This is my problem. And I had hope that the king would have done something in that. Because looking at history, they're going to walk on the boardwalk, look at the murals, which is the expression of art through painting I, I think that's a wonderful thing because very often artists don't get the recognition in Samaritan that they deserve not do musicians that they really deserve because we don't put the money in it there's no money in that industry for people one or two are successful and the rest are not but again like I said I think if that attention was given I think it would have been it would have become great I think also what would have been interesting for the king to just have a discussion would have been with what's happening with the World Bank. That is Dutch money, if we like it or not. That's Dutch money. And it would have been good if the king could have seen firsthand what's happening. And you're touring the airport, a disaster, Bunch of money being thrown into it again because they have to fix up somebody's contracts. You go into the hospital, another fiasco. But you're not visiting the Sister Marie Laurent School that after seven years hasn't been rebuilt. You're not checking the Charles Leopold School that hasn't been put in operation yet. The hundreds of seniors that still don't have a roof. They undocumented that we given 12 to 14 million dollars to. Those would have been good things to see and understand what truly happened in this country. Again, maybe a drive through some of the side roads of some of the districts like St. Peter's, a Dutch Quarter, a Middle Region, Okay, be cool, be. 
would have shown how we truly live. Would have shown the hidden poverty now by the beautiful program put together for the king. So when we all leave after the seventh, everybody feels good, everybody is happy, we put out our best foot. But that's not what it's about. When your royal family comes to your country, yes, you can put out a good foot, but show them the realities. Show them how their citizens are living. That's our obligation too. And we always fail because we always want to put out our best foot. Sometimes it's good for them to see how bad the roads are. And maybe God works in mysterious ways. And that's why Bush Road is in the state it is today because they're going to have to drive over that road at least five to seven times. So they go, bum, 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 bum. They gonna feel good. They said, but what happened here? Uh, are you need money for the roads? Come, maybe I could get some from in Holland. Undocumented people have rights too. But again, for me, I have an issue with the way this works. And again, this problem with the NIPB and the resettlement program, the RAP program, the way this goes and the laws of the country that are just being pushed aside is not correct. I, I don't care what nobody tells me. I cannot understand why we even allow this, that the World Bank believes it's their policy. I agree with it. And if the laws of the country were able to support it, I would have said, okay, but you cannot tell me that the Minister of Justice cannot execute her work because the Immigration Department can't go in there. If one of these people is picked up in town because the police start checking stores, checking buses, and they pick up someone that lives on Pawn Island, has been, is registered there, reaches the police station, cannot show, cannot show that they have legal residency on this island. Can now say, hey, but hold on, hold on officers, you are already sending me no place. I live illegally at the landfill, so I can stay, because the World Bank said so, because they still got to pay me. How, how, do we, how do you sell this? And then the minister says, well, 90% opted to take money, so we ain't talking about it. You serious? So are we agreeing that we're going to pay all these illegal people to please the World Bank with a policy? Because the World Bank isn't taking this money out of their pocket. They are taking this money from the donor, which again is the sovereign country of the Netherlands in the kingdom of the Netherlands, a kingdom partner to St. Martin. They are taking that money and doing this. Again, this is fundamentally wrong. This is a crime, people. And I would like to know what the prosecutor's office is going to do about it. Because it's a crime. The World Bank is not a treaty. It's not a law. It's their policy. And if somebody signed on to that policy, then prosecute them. Then prosecute them. Because they put the country in a position that's irresponsible. You see, all this the, the, the diplomacy, you know, this is where things go wrong. This is where countries lose their footing in the public eyes. It would mean that the same thing America could say, okay, come in, you're illegal. Um, okay, but I, I'll give you a house, I'll give you a job. In Holland, in Holland, they have a serious problem right now with refugees. And just now the door gonna close. And we can say, yeah, but it's unhumane, understood. But when you are destroying your own country, 
then it is not inhumane. You're going to survive. Your people are going to survive. And this is the problem with Samaritan. We have left immigration go unchecked for a very long time. Now, they started the clean up a little bit. I'm not saying we are home scot-free because a lot of um, cases have been lost in courts where judges said that the minister is wrong to deport or, or, or reject a permit request, etc., etc. Bottom line is this. We try, but now we find ourselves in a quagmire where we are being told by a foreign entity that we can't deport people, otherwise they're going to stop the project of fixing the landfill. So if you want me to fix the landfill for 30, 40 million dollars, you have to allow me to give away this 12 million dollars. That's it. That's how it is, packaged. So let's see. Let's see what's going to happen, because at the end of the day now, they're going to have to for the 10% that decided they are not taking money, they're going to have to find land to build their homes, they're going to have to find land to build their businesses, they're going to have to give them business licenses, even though, even though they were operating on an illegal parcel of land, because I just always be surprised when they say, yeah, but they had a business license. How can you have a business license if you need an operating license to operate? Because you get a business, you see, this is the problem with Samaritan. When you ask for a work permit, when you get a work permit, you have to ask for a residence permit. It's one government. It should be. When you get a work permit, the residence permit is there. When you get a business license, the operations license is there. Right now, everything is split in. So what do you do? You get abuse of people. They abuse the people by playing games with it within the government. This one says yes, yeah, then this one says no. So the right hand grants you the business license and then the operating license is said no to because all the different checks and balances and they have this nice little thing they write at the bottom of the, the um, license or the permit. Um, you still have to be in compliance with all the other things in Samantha. So the people have nothing. So if that abuse is being spoken about, yes, I agree. That happens all too often. But an immigration law and we pain and we sign off on border control. And this can happen with the blessings of the same country, the Netherlands, that we signed an agreement with for border control. It just doesn't make sense. But some of us are just afraid to open our mouths and say something because we will be punished. But I have a message to all involved. I hope, I honest to God hope, that the Minister of Finance gets his team together and goes to the um, NRPB and demands a list of all the people that are requesting a payout and those that want land or whatever and have them assessed. Have all of them assessed. See whoever filed their taxes. See whoever paid taxes. Because if none of them did, and I got a feeling a lot of them didn't, then the government can assess them first. And when that assessment is finished, then you can pay them what is due to them, and you pay the government what's due to them. It ain't as if that project going any place so fast because they ain't got no money to go fix nothing on the landfill yet. They don't need about a fool you. Oh, we got to do this before we... Die. Listen, they could have put the murph up there if they wanted a long time ago. They could have started recycling a long time ago. They don't need to shift around because they ain't going to do all of that. There's a lot of talk. They had a big meeting last week. Unfortunately, they said, I... Um, because I wanted to go. They were going to talk about waste management. I wanted to be there. I wanted to voice my opinion. I registered wrong, they said. And when they sent me the paper, indeed, I put a, a, a hyphen where I shouldn't have put it. I unfortunately missed it, but I got the presentation. And it looks like a school child made a presentation. 
This cannot be a presentation supported by the World Bank. But that's for a different vision and for a different presentation of minds in this podcast. Today, I'm not going to waste any time on it. What I want to say is I hope that there's an assessment done on all the people that are going to get money. Because you cannot tell me that $12,366,000 is going to be paid out to people that haven't filed taxes, haven't paid taxes, and are undocumented on this island. This is absurd. And all ministers involved in this should be held accountable. So Minister of Finance, I hope you, as the gatekeeper of the tax office and the financials of this country, make sure everybody is assessed. And whatever is due to us, we get. Because this is craziness. And I would hope that the prosecutor's office, Madam Prosecutor, I hope that you look into this thing about undocumented people being able to cash out instead of being deported. Because then crime does pay. Because being illegal in a country is a crime. And I can recall your old slogan, crime doesn't pay. Well, I'm telling you in your face right now, crime does pay. Just go down by the landfill, you'll see. You'll see. Let's move on. We don't even have houses for our own people. But we are giving the undocumented housing. Our own people, we have a waiting list of thousands at the Samaritan Housing Foundation. But we can find money to build new houses and land to put undocumented people in. And nobody should say nothing because the World Bank said this is their policy. And if we don't like it, then they will scrap the project. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what to, I, I don't know what to say. I can only laugh. Because this this is the biggest BS I've ever heard. And that our people, our own people at NRPB, swallow this hook, line, and sinker for a paycheck is sad. Because I know they know better. I know they know better. But this is for a paycheck. And that's hurtful. TOT farms were available. Have those businesses ever paid TOT? Because they said they got businesses in their lucrative businesses. Have they ever paid TOT? These are things that we want to know. We prosecute people in this country for tax fraud. We prosecute them. I was one. I won. But I was prosecuted for years. I so-called took monies from economical rights and blah, blah, blah. And I didn't file my taxes correctly. I won. Because you don't have to file taxes for economical rights. That I can tell you factually. Professor Kuhneman wrote the piece on it. The same one that gave all the integrity trainings a few days ago to the people in Samantha. You see, these are the type of things that need to start coming out. We need to start talking about them. But again, like I said, if we really want to do it the correct way, I know the Prime Minister says she needs to generate a lot of revenues now to make sure that Budget 23 is going to be done correctly. We'll talk about it. But like I said, we need to do things in a better way. So let's see what's going to happen and let's see where we're going. Now, there was another thing that caught me when they had the farewell of Professor Dr. Ray Raymond Grades from the CFT, the former CFT chairman. He was chairman for close to six years. And there were a few words spoken by the Vice President of the Council of State, uh, Mr. Tom de Graaf, and he basically said, equality is not necessarily equality. And I said, what? Where are we going? But as I listened, I realized 
where he was going. And basically, he said, look, the dispute regulation that we have been fighting for since 2010, which is Article 12 sub A in the Charter of the Kingdom, the Kingdom Charter, that that will never work the way we intend it to work. But if we would look at the dispute regulation that the CFT, the RFT law, the Reichsfinanzielle Zuzigswet, if we look at that dispute regulation and maybe apply that, that might work. And he says, you got to understand that 18 million people that live across the ocean in a sovereign country, the Netherlands, is not equal to the 350,000 people that live on the six islands in the Caribbean Dutch. It is not equal. It will never be treated equal. And then I said, okay, okay. The question then was, what exactly are you saying? And I broke it down in two, 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 two sections. One of being like, the dispute regulation will never be to the disadvantage of the Netherlands, as they are the only sovereign country in the kingdom. So that might be how the equality is not equality. But pay for everything yourself, and we will always be equal as you're not subjected to any demands from us as you don't need to request funding. So there will be no dispute when it comes to that with funding and Article 38, we, we help each other, etc., etc. won't be necessary. Changing the charter is a farce as the Netherlands isn't going to just simply let their grip on the islands go knowing full well that in this day and age, we will not survive um, the way we are operating at present. So these are things maybe that he is thinking of and saying equality is not equality. We are not financially strong. We can't take care of ourselves. We have some people walking around screaming independence and um, we're going to destroy the country instead of rebuilding the country. Maybe that was an undertone that he was trying to sell. Maybe totally different, he might have said, we have made some serious mistakes and abused the well-being of the Dutch Caribbean people for donkey years, and we're working on changing the necessary laws to make everyone equal in the eyes of the law, the social system, the tax system, etc. So maybe there we'll see some equality equality in taxes, equality in the social system, and equality in the law, because all three are different right now. In Samaritan, we don't get the social, well, the social care, uh, the social, the social um, pensions like the Netherlands, the minimum wage like the Netherlands. We don't get that, but that's because we don't pay for it. Our tax system, is always lower than that of the Dutch. So again, I like how you say it, Beverly, um, equality is about equity. And as long as equity is not the same, you're never going to be equal. I agree with you. I was just trying to keep it a little more simple that they understand by giving the examples that I'm trying to show. Again, maybe they also, because remember in the law, oh, our, our, punishment has shown over the years in the studies is much harsher in the small in the islands than it is in the Netherlands and because an island is small everybody knows each other they immediately jump on the bandwagon that you should have been an example see if somebody does something in Groningen in Holland and they go live in Amsterdam nobody knows it there's three hours apart with a train but if I do something in Phillipsburg I can't go St. Peter's because they are one of still so. So the, the, the laws are different. The way we punish people are different. I brought it up a few weeks, uh, two weeks ago. I said a man uh, stole, took a hundred, what, 900 and something thousand euros. The man got 180 hours community service. He had a lock of people for years, if that would have happened. So again, but to move on, 
The Dutch might have said also under the equality, it's not equality, that they want to change the charter and ensure that full autonomy is there and we will move the governor and allow the country to appoint their own representatives that will vet their laws. Now, you see, this is where politically the apology of the king would have meant so much because the governor who signs our laws into law represents the governor, represents the king. Not Ritter and them, represents the king. So we have a formal position in the government for the king. We, when we take an oath, we take an oath, either we swear um, to God, or we take an oath to be loyal to the king. You see how important that role still is? And the last thing is that the Netherlands will assist to maintain the treaties they signed on to on behalf of the kingdom so the islands in consultation with the islands. Now, one such treaty is the Human Rights Treaty. The Dutch signed it, we took it over, but we can't afford a prison. Um, for our prisoners and we have problems all day and we have had cases of um, neglect in human rights etc 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 maybe they want to fix that for us I don't know but these are the type of things that I believe that when we talk about equality is not equality might have an effect on both sides of the fence let's talk about the budget 2023 here we go again now this morning I was reading the newspaper and I listened to the Prime Minister last week and there was an article in the newspaper and I am, I am, I am continuously being surprised by the, the, the naivety of the Prime Minister. Thinking that people continue believing what she's saying. Look, the amended budget 2022 was not approved. Budget 2023 was sent back. And it was sent back because of a few things. And this morning, the article gave a little clarity on the aspect of why the budget is a problem. The CFT said, people, you hand in the 2019-2020 year reports. Both those reports did not get a positive qualification from no SOB, nor the General Audit Chamber. Both of them said that those two reports do not reflect the reality of St. Martin's financial position. That's a serious problem, people. That's a very serious problem. Besides that, the depths that were incurred in 2019 and in 2020 are still not, and then you yeah, had 2021, 2022, are still not shown in budget 2023. How are you going to pay for it? Now, again, I don't want to battle down on the minister alone on this one, the minister of finance, because he's not fully at fault. I'll explain. So Martin had to borrow a good bit of money during the whole COVID-19 pandemic and those were all bullet loans and there was zero percent bullet loans and if anybody can recall I spoke about those loans because I had a fear for those loans I kept saying we need to come to an agreement on these loans that was my last discussion I had on the floor of Parliament when we discussed budget 2022 in December 2021 I spoke of that and I had the fear and that fear has become a reality two things happened in the meantime there is the most zero percent loan the loans right now are 2.3 or 2.4 percent and they will increase most probably to 3.5 percent because that's what the Netherlands is lending money for right now on the capital market they're not getting it for free 
So we are not going to get it um, exempted either. And at no point in time has Holland even agreed to this. While we speak of debt cancellation, and some politicians now started, yeah, um, because you all have acknowledged slavery as, as the Dutch government, you should do debt cancellation of the 1.3 billion that um, we owe the Netherlands on loans. It would be great if such is done. But I am not that optimistic that that's going to be done. The Dutch have always been able to play us based on our emotions. The rationale is we own the money. We owe them that money. The rationale is also they never allowed us to borrow from anybody else. So they manipulated us to become a financial prisoner from them. Can you recall the time that the Minister of Finance had put out a bond, I think it was for 75 million guilders, and Knops came out and made a furor. How is this and how is that? And places like SSV, Maduro and Curiel's Bank, pension fund that had signed on to buy this loan. Because the central bank went out and sought if there was appetite, and there was appetite, so they put it out. And the minister did this so he does not have to continue taking money from the Dutch and tie himself down with conditions. They shut it down. Knops and Grades did that with the CFT. They shut it down. So I don't blame the minister alone because he did try. He honestly did try and I'll give him credit for that. But at this point in time, the minister's playing a game of cat and mouse. I can't fix the budget because the Dutch ain't telling me what they're going to do with the loans. The Dutch don't have nothing to tell you. You owe the money. You owe it. So what you should do is put it on the budget and tell them you have a deficit. Just like how the IMF said, it cannot be done. It, you can't do it. As long as they don't give you a deal with refinancing or Removal of the debts, you will have a deficit, son. Put it on and send it through. And if they say we can't accept it, then put me under higher supervision and done. Then you go fix it. Then you go fix it as Holland. Because what they are doing with you is they are setting you up for the kill. And politically, I shouldn't be talking this with you. I should just let it happen. But I think you're a good person. You genuinely are trying to do something for us. But again, again, you cannot hold the country hostage by not bringing the budget to the floor. Let the floor of parliament approve it with a deficit. The CFT can jump as high as they want, but since the CFT is not the one that can give a exemption for a budget, with a deficit, only the Kingdom Council of Ministers can. And since they already said they are not given it, then you have a problem, Minister. Then you have a problem. Because the same Kingdom Council of Ministers has not answered anything about a rollover. What they said is we're going to start the discussion. That don't mean you have anything. Come March 31st, I think it is. You have to have answered the Kingdom Council of Ministers on how that budget deficit is going to be taken up in the budget 2023. I, I don't know what you're waiting on. Send it. And as long as they don't come over the bridge, you have done what you can do. You have been honest with the situation. But if you keep dancing around it, eventually they're going to blame you for it. And say you were not prepared and you didn't do this and you didn't do that and you didn't do that. Just be careful, Minister. Because those Dutch boys, they play chess. They don't play checkers. Down here, you all are playing checkers. And before you know, you're going to be checkmated. So be very, very careful with this. I have realized, and you have realized, that Samadhan is in a very awkward position right now when it comes 
to their financial position. The General Audit Chamber, SWAB, CFT, they are all very concerned with our position when it comes to sol the solvency of this country. We went from 15 to 30 plus percent. We doubled in the last few years and we're going to continue going up as long as these debts are not dealt with. Our solvency is going to get worse. And that means our equity will drop. And that basically means our EBITDA is going to be in serious trouble and the country is going to be financially very unstable. It is not something I'm going to delve in now and go overboard on, but it is something that I believe the, the minister should speak a little more about, explain the people in Samaritan that it's not going to be a smooth ride going forward. While right now we are not going to feel the recession um, of Europe and America, we're not going to really feel it because the Americans are still spending and Europe is spending just as much to keep that tilt in balance. We, we got to understand though that we have a problem and our problem is our budget isn't closing. And the Prime Minister said last week she will we will do what we have to do to generate those revenues. That's scary because those revenues are 100 plus million. And unless we got a magic box or a printing shop, we cannot, we cannot generate those revenues. So when they start going out on tax sprees again, because collecting a little extra F pact or uh, having a few extra billing permits approved is not, is not going to cut it. We need serious money. Tax reform would have played a serious role had we done it since last year. It would have played a serious role. But up till this day, we have not done anything with tax reform. And again, more presentations are going to be made in in Parliament, but what we need now is action. For years we have been playing with a tax reform. I, I, I think we know what we want. I think we know what we want. I think we know what we need. We have to get rid of the turnover tax. You can't increase it. You have to get rid of it and bring in the import duty. Because the import duty alone will give you an additional 50 million over your turnover tax income. But the love is spread then. We need to do more. We're not doing enough, and I think we're going to get ourselves in a very awkward position very soon. I think the minister needs to understand that the people in Samaritan are tired. A livable wage is 3,500 guilders or $2,000. We have increased our minimum wage from eight guilders 84 to about 10 guilders, a guilder 16, so about 180 guilders more per month, or 200, or 200 guilders more a month. Bang, and cut it. Just the GB bill gone up more than that. Just the GB bill. Fuel class is through the roof, it's killing people. So I think we have a bigger problem on our hand than just a budget deficit. You have to look at what the consequences are going to be of the budget deficit when they strangle us down a little more and the people start to jump but we have about 70 percent of this country that earns under a livable wage of 3500 guilders so this country got a serious problem and minister i know you can't do this one alone but i'm sure that if you start putting on your foot on all the monies that are being misspent the way they are being misspent Hopefully then, we can then do something better than what's happening right now. I agree with you on that one, Shoes, but that's a discussion for another time with um, the payments on SSB and so. But I'll tell you this much. We need to be honest with the people. We are not. The Prime Minister is the, the spokesperson for this country 
is telling too many untruths. The last one she pulled off on is when she said that oh, all the road patching and road paving and district cleaning, that's all part and parcel of the regular works in Samaritan. It used to be. I agree with you wholeheartedly. It used to be so a few years ago. But last year, road patching, road works were hardly done. District cleaning stopped in October. It's still not back. So right now, it's not part of the usual work. What it is, is that you're telling a little untruth. Thank God. You're nosy like the one from Pinocchio. Because if it was, you'd be touching Mount Scenery and Saber right now. You tell so much of them already. The forgotten ones. This is, this is one of them that hurts me a little bit. And that's why I said today is going to be a gut-wrenching um, show. Because when I think on how we treat our seniors, the only thought that can come to my mind is that they are the forgotten ones. I, I, I just spoke about equality a little earlier. That equality is not equality. I spoke about the budget woes of 2023. I also even spoke about the rights of undocumented people. And you realize that the pensioners, they are all missing on everything. We promised them an increase. I don't know if the increase is going to be paid or not. Many pensioners have called me and said they did not receive an increase. And I said, I don't know. I don't know how it works. And I tried to get a little information, but I, I wasn't uh, successful in finding out exactly how it is, how that increase is going to be given. I know sometime back there they had a problem with, um, I think it was in January when they paid the pension, that um, early January, I think they paid pension. Oh uh, no, late December they paid January, but because the law only went into effect the end of December, the increase for January couldn't have been paid. So hopefully now it should have shown on the February payment that would have come in at the end of January that the increase was given and the January increase. But again, I don't know. I, I, nobody has confirmed that they got this money. So if you are listening and, and you can say you got the money, please, I'd appreciate it. So at least we know because up until today, I have to go out of the fact that the increase um, was not given. So um, we'll see about that and, and how that comes out. Um, but at this point in time, we continue taxing the seniors. This is something we should have stopped. I begged the Minister of Finance, and on this one I will not let him get a free pass. I begged him, literally begged the man, and said, please adjust the pension law. We are talking about a few thousand people where you set the limit higher. We all know, we all know that a livable wage is 3,500 guilders. Yet, a pensioner above minimum wage is taxed. We know they can't afford it. We have pensioners that can't afford to buy food and pay utilities. So it's one of the two. Most of them prefer to starve and pay GB so they have light and water. These are our people we're talking about. Our people. But for one reason or the other, we are hell-bent on not really helping them. Why, why is that? I, I, I cannot understand it. Maybe... Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't understand why we can't help the seniors. There's no relief by GB. There's no more relief with food vouchers or anything. There's no relief in taxation. I mean, what, 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 what can I say? I'll set this much for the record, because I am a parliamentarian too. When I was a civil servant, I paid from my salary into the pension fund. Today, as a parliamentarian, we are not paying 
into the pension fund. Unless they change it, and I didn't even realize it on my salary. But to my knowledge, we don't pay. Yet we get a pension at the end of our term. But we didn't pay a cent. So if it is good for us, why can't we not do this for the seniors? I, 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 I do not understand it. And don't get mad with me for what I'm saying. Work with me to help the seniors. For God's sakes, man. We too, someday, will become a senior. God gives us that strength in life. We will become a senior. And the same way we are treating them today, the youngsters that follow in us can treat us. But God is saying, if they didn't care anyway, why should we care? And you can't blame them then. Because we are not setting the foundation for our seniors. Those people have worked and built this country. Yet, for one reason or the other, because nobody could give me a reason that is valid. Telling me the law can't change is BS. All right? Emergency laws were made for the solidarity movement, 12 and a half, 25%, top owners, and blah, 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 blah. It was done. When the prime minister had to go and force through a law illegally in parliament to justify paying the vacation allowance, it was done. So don't tell me it can't be done. You're going to stop lying to the seniors. Because you're lying to your fathers and mothers. Or your grandfathers and your grandmothers. You're going to stop it. You're going to be ashamed of your damn selves. I had enough of your games. But yeah. When we go to the polls, I hope they remember you all well. I truly hope they remember you all well. Because you cannot... With a straight face there, you have done anything for the senior citizens of Samaritan for the past three and a half years. Nothing you have done. Noise pollution in Samaritan. Let me, let me give credit to Ms. Beverly May Nisbet. She holds a master's in, envi in environmental science. See, Minister, if you need somebody to walk in Vromi that is local, that knows about these type of things, call the lady. She's well versed in the environment. She's one of we. She is qualified. But for one reason or the other, they just simply can't get a job here. There's another one, another gentleman with a master's degree that works by the Mac. And I had a whole presentation on recycling. Applied. Applied by government. Hasn't even been given the courtesy of an answer. But you're qualified. All right, let's start to move on. What is noise pollution? Any noise that is annoying or harmful to people or animals is in my opinion noise pollution and I'm not going to get into the effects because then it becomes too long a story for a short podcast episode. Sources of noise pollution and this is not a complete list but just think when we talk about businesses, think on bars and restaurants that have to play for the neighborhood, think on dance clubs that play for the neighborhood and not for the dance floor, think on festivals, sports venues, that the volume sometimes goes up higher than it should. Think on construction sites where they are working beside you, but they're jackhammering away day and night trying to bust open old foundations. While this is part of, understand that this is part of the works, it is a form of noise pollution. Even car washes, people are trying to make a dollar to feed their family, they wash cars at night. Because during the day, they're hustling, doing another job, and they're wa washing the car, and you know, they're washing it at home, but people live next door. It's noise pollution. When you get into the private sector, and this is one I hope the police really goes after. I have seen cars in Samaritan. The back two windows, the speakers 
blazing outwards. So they ain't even playing for the music in the kind of. They play the music for people outside to hear. You ever hear more stupidity? That is serious noise pollution. That should be stopped. Because they play songs also with languages that normally should not be spoken. But hey, we all I got I got dot them all too. Okay? I cause bad words too. But I cause them where I stand up. I don't play them. So the neighbors in St. Peter's or in Sanders could hear them. When these cars driving coming down the road, it even scares you sometimes because you want to know where the noise coming from. As if you run up on something, it's a car behind you or a car in front of you doing this or two cars behind you. This is noise pollution has to be really, really be dealt with. Even people at home, sometimes you have a party and nothing wrong with you having a birthday party, you know, but you don't need to play for the neighbors. Your guests don't have to go home hearing a zooming in their ear because you had the music jack up so high. This one here is going to be a touchy one. Firecrackers. You know I am an advocate against animal cruelty. And fireworks and dogs don't go hand in hand. Why? Dogs are 100% more, 100 times more sensitive than human beings are. And while I love fireworks myself, I ain't gonna lie to you, I love the fireworks. I don't like to throw it no more. When I was young, I used to throw it. But nowadays, I, I stay away from that a little bit. I, I go and I look at the shows, and I understand for the animals, it's a problem. And there are silent fireworks, but I think we're gonna have to change our habits and culture because we all want to hear a boom, boom. But that is detrimental for the animals. And I can recall after the New Year's, there were a lot of things on Facebook with animals that ended up in other people's yard um, hiding because they were confused, they were lost. So again, while we speak of it, sometimes it's good we practice it. But again, I know it's going to be something that we have to work on. We've got people got to change. We really got to change our habits before we do firework. But other sources of noise pollution is also traffic. When you get a big truck, it's a broom, broom, bah, bah. It is noise pollution. While we have rules and regulations for the roads, roads bring noise pollution. Not intentionally, because people have to drive, but noise comes with it. Especially when you have damaged, um, I call those things there now, um, covers, road covers, like with the, with the sewage and all of them, and with um, GB or, or whichever one have them in the road, sometimes those things get damaged. And then you hear, blang, blang, blang. Every time a car pass over it, that thing is making noise out of it. And people can't sleep because anytime a car pass, you have that noise. Now, that's a pollution that is not needed but is there. But traffic in its own brings a lot of noise pollution. Music during carnival. You know when people, when, when, when the trucks are going down during... Um, the big parades or the juvies. Look, it is noise pollution, but in my eyes, I am a carnival lover too. I understand um, it's just once a year. So I'm gonna make a fuss out of it, but I only think it's fair that you do put it there because it is noise pollution, because noise pollution is anything that brings unnecessary bother or harm to a person or an animal. Remember sometimes when we're going down front street and they have buildings on both sides and you have those speakers boo bossing the base. You got to put in earplugs for the little children and sometimes even adults need earplugs because sometimes you walk away deaf from a parade. So again these are type of things you know that they are noise pollution and we should be considerate with them. I'm not saying that it's done intentionally, but sometimes we can be more considerate how we play the music. If you are playing music during the carnival, you don't need to overpower the band behind you because you're not competing with him. You're playing music for the people dancing behind you. That's, that's what I mean with being considerate in the carnival. And you know, also commercial vehicles, they have these big horns, these big air horns, those things um, while 
they use them for emergency situations sometimes you use them to heal each other but they are a form of noise pollution and especially depending where you are it can be very annoying now how do we deal with this how do we attack the strategy where do we start i think the first thing we should start doing is review and upgrade the laws and the policies in order to define the noise nuisance make punishable certain uh, pollutions of noise by law make seizing possible think on these car radio things i tell you about with this the back windows full of and they gotta take those things and go with them this is crazy those things gotta be punished it is not normal it shouldn't be allowed it shouldn't be even tolerated give stiffer fines to make a difference if if a business has been warned a few times about their noise you can give them a few fines and after that maybe shut them down for a week because you you got to be able to show them that the fine because right now it's normally a little 75 gilda fine everybody pays 75 gilda they make that back in 10 minutes at the bar but if you shut them down for a week that's a different story so i can remember they had they used to have a lot of problems in the simpson bay area with noise so you know again i am not telling everybody what to do but i'm saying these are things we have to look at if we truly want to deal with noise pollution these are things that we have to, to to really go after you know look we have to have some public awareness campaigns about noise pollution and the laws um let's do this on the radio stations uh, social media platform billboards we have a lot of these um digital billboards maybe we can talk to them and say can we get a little spot um and it says noise pollution is also punishable you know look people gotta become aware of it we, I, I can talk about it today for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, but pe people are going to forget it. You need to indoctrinate this into people. Noise pollution is not okay. Yes, you can tolerate it sometimes, but it's not okay. It's not something that should become the norm that we are living in. Th th this, this is what I mean with it. And maybe we can talk to business owners, call town hall meetings for business owners. Let's discuss it. Let's see where we can make the change. How can we meet with each other? And you see, I, th I think when we start doing this, we will show the other side of the Samaritan people because we are understanding people. Look, you always got some fools in between, but most of the people mean well. And if we show them, hey, we are having this problem, I am sure at the end of the day, they will go with it and say, um, you know, we, we, we have something that looks at this from a different angle. You understand? Uh, we can increase the crackdowns. We can go down into the neighborhoods where we are having these problems, onto the strips, Phillipsburg, Boardwalk, Simpson Bay, wherever it is, and sometimes do a little something, you know? create a database so we know where the problems are and how we can tackle them. And naturally, we have to zone our residential areas better because sometimes you realize in residential areas that we allow commercial businesses that bring a lot of noise with it. Now, if you have a supermarket in a, com in, 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 in a neighborhood, it's totally different than if you put a discotheque that is open roof because the noise is, is significantly different and, and, and people can, you know, maneuver. So again, even I see the king is going to visit tomorrow. He's going for a, a birding tour at Fort Amsterdam. But have you noticed that we don't protect bird areas? The noise is blaring at night and those animals, that's where they sleep. That's where they nest. These are things that, it's a small island. Space is limited, but we have to zone. You could remember they, they spoke about this, this um, what, what, what they called it? The strategic environmental plan. These are things that should be in it. These are the things that should have been in it, but are not in it. Again, there's much more that we can talk about it, but I want to move on. Point Blanche prison inmates. This is another group of forgotten and I saw an article a few days ago, I think it was, in SMN News. And it brought me right back to the parliament meeting of a week or two ago, where um, there was to be an issue discussed on 
the medical care of prisoners and the food of prisoners, the flow of prisoners. And instead of addressing those points directly, um, there was a presentation given, which is always good if it directly addresses the situation at hand. Now, I don't know if it addressed it at hand. I get the impression that the answer is no to that. They also had UNOPS there that addressed it, um, give a presentation of what they're planning for the first quarter. But when I read the article, I said, you know, th this is not off the ball. There were certain things in that article. I said, let me take an excerpt and discuss them this morning or bring them to you all. So whoever missed that article, at least let me give it to you how I read it. Um, the last few days, they were barraged with information on the mismanagement by the management team and the Minister of Justice and the lack of health supervision happening at the Phillipsburg holding cells and Point Blanche prison in Samaritan. Many of us have read articles written by key persons in our community, but few were the ones really tackling the main problems and bringing possible solutions to the forefront regarding the prison situation. This also brings right away on the forefront of me, the letter written by the family of the late gentleman who was arrested and passed away the next day in the cell at the Philipsburg police station. It was quickly ruled that there was no foul play, yet there was no autopsy done, and the good gentleman who seemed to be in good health died within 24 hours of being in a police cell. Now, I am not saying anything happened. But to take away any doubt, I think it would have been great to have an autopsy done and see what the cause of death was. Because you got to be very, very careful when somebody goes to jail and doesn't come back out of jail alive. But again, what I truly enjoyed from the letter, or the, the piece that was written, was the position that the lady took. And the passage that she made was where she stated, before going into the saga of the Point Blanc prison, I would like to show my sympathy to the family members of any person that became a victim of an incarcerated person. This article is not to talk positively about any person in the system, because when you commit a crime, you should do the time. But it is to bring awareness to the human rights violation committed against a detainee and this is what caught my attention because St. Martin has had a few cases now already at the International Human Rights Courts in Geneva where the government of the Netherlands and the government of St. Martin got a good whipping because we are not living up to the human rights of the people. While many politicians talk about the human rights of the people in the landfill, we seem to forget all of those in the jail. Jail make for all of us, make no mistake. And they are all human beings. But according to the author, we are all well aware in government that the detainees have rights and these rights are written in the Landsbesluit um, Houdende vaststelling van gevangenisstraf. Um, that's a, 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 a decree where they explain you the prison measures, how the prison measures should be um, applied. Many violations. This law is known by the people in government for sure, Minister of Justice, Ministry Department. But for one reason or the other, they're not applying these laws adequately creating a lot of violations. Now, the, the most important violation, and I think that's what uh, was done here, was the one about health. Now, in the one about health, they are talking about the health care provided to the detainees. Now, there were different things that they spoke about, but for example, in Article 7, Sub 1 of the National Decree containing the general measures of adopting prison measures, 
The minister assisted by the head of the services and the directors are responsible for appropriate medical care for the detainees. This has not been happening for years according to the prisoner association representatives. When I went to par as a parliamentarian to the prison, we had these same discussions. I spoke to detainees and I spoke to the association and both of them brought to the forefront the problems we are having with health care. For them, it was like this. There's no doctor on site. Once a week, a doctor comes, and half the time, they don't even get a chance to see the doctor. There's a nurse there, but the nurse does not help them enough. They feel that they are being um, just browsed through fast. Um, they had an issue with dentistry. If they couldn't pay for dental care, they couldn't get dental care. These are prisoners. Where, where do you expect them to get the money? You took away their freedom because they broke the law. But then you have to take care of certain things. You can't just push them aside. Prisoners, when they come in new into the system, normally are checked medically. They are checked for COVID-19. They are checked for TB, tuberculosis. They are checked for HIV. These are all diseases that can have fatal consequences and are very, very infectious. They transmit very easily. But if they're not tested for them and they're just put into the prison system, that means you're putting prisoners at risk. This is one of the complaints that also came out and they spoke to the, the people about them. Um, one of the other things that they said that they were having a problem with was the prisoners are given um, a, a prescription, medical prescription. Once a week, they, they get um, Xanax. And that is just to, you know, listen, you're in jail. You, you get stressed. You have anxiety attacks. So they give them medication to ensure that they can feel a little at ease. Medication ran out, so they brought a new medication, and they are complaining that the medication that they're getting now, a Xanax was 1.5 milligram, and the medication they're getting now is 15 milligram or 10 times as strong, um, and some, most of them are not swallowing the medication. They don't trust it. Um, I I am surprised that they would do this because you can make these people are pill addicts before you know. But again, I don't want to go in detail because I don't have the, this is part of the article that I am I'm a little cautious with. Also, um, the whole matter of medical staff being there for 24 hours, etc., cetera, um, being a problem. And many, many of the staffers themselves have said that this is a big problem there and we should be looking at it um, from a different um, perspective. There was even a complaint of an inmate that is presently there and is suffering from an infection and he cannot get the operation that he needs to deal with the infection and whatever they have given him thus far has not um, yielded the, the stomach infection that the, the gentleman has, a very um, severe infection. Um, in his ab abdominum and he has it now seemingly for years and it's only getting worse because he's not getting the proper care. So again, you know, the, these are things that I, I believe we need to pay attention to um, because it's, it's, it's not working the way it should work. And I'm saying that maybe the minister can, can give a better um, indication of what's really happening here to ensure that this, this, this will be done a little better because right now it is not, you know? And I, I think seeing what just happened in Phillipsburg with, with, with a, a detainee passing away, just like that, um, hearing what's happening up there, knowing that we are at full capacity up there already, I, I think we gotta be um, cautious on how we go about it. But you see, it is, when you see a situation like that, with the prison, you're saying, okay, so why isn't money being made available from the World Bank to build a prison? St. Martin cannot cough up the 40 million they're looking for. Holland is given 30 million directly, not through the World Bank, directly. 
And some man got caught for 40 million because this prison gonna cost about 70 million, give and take. And 10 million going for operations, I believe, through the Netherlands. My, my thing is this. Okay, so we're doing this. But at the end of the day, when will Samantin build that prison? Because UNEPS is now starting, but the money isn't there. With the, with the problems we have in budget 2023, the amount of money we're talking about for the prison, I, I don't see this happening. I'm going to be honest with you, I don't see this happening. And this is where I would have hoped that monies from this trust fund could have been allocated to something where human rights are being trampled on every day, if we like it or not. The conditions they are living in, in the prison, are not to write home about. I have seen the cells myself. So the minister don't need to tell me them. I know how they are. And they ain't changed nothing up there. A good gym, a nice basketball field, great. But they spend an hour out there to do those things. The other 23 hours, they lock up. So how? You didn't fix inside first and then fix outside after. That's what it's about. Because they are in a deplorable situation, if we like it or not. Since I took office, and that was February 9th, 2020, I started the process to get the usage and the planting of weed for personal usage tolerated. And until this day, I must say, simply nothing tangible is happening. As an MP, I campaigned on this. I said, it is something we can do to make a new pillar in the economy, legalize something that is illegal, create wealth among our own that today have no hope of making it in the country by making them entrepreneurs in the farming of weed, make them entrepreneurs in the distribution of weed, make them entrepreneurs in the retailing of weed. The clientele is an island. Let us not fool ourselves, please. Let us not be this naive, please. Last week I spoke about regulating the sex workers. Let us not be naive as if it isn't here. Because that's what we are good at. Stick our head in the sand and hope it goes away. Guess what? It ain't going no place. The ostrich days are over. They are over. So we're going to have to deal with these problems and make these problems solutions to enhance the economy of this country. We did an RFP. Something I was very vocal about. I didn't agree with it. And some people in Samaritan told me, ah, man, don't be so negative. Today, we know for a fact that no Samaritan has brought in any ideas in the RFP proposals, the request for the proposals, that were of substance. Because they cannot, and it is understandable. But why we are reinventing the wheel is what has me baffled. Because in Holland, all the needed information is there. Go Antigua, go St. Kitts, go Totola, go St. Lucia, go Grenada, go St. Vince. It's there, people. It's there. But we want a request for proposal. Groups came in, yes, from Canada. Because they want to take it. They would want everything, the whole hog. But that defeats the complete purpose of this. Because this, when I campaigned for it, 
and I stand by it today. This economical product is for we own. They see for no outside people to come with money and put a Samaritan fella in front. That ain't gonna walk. That stupidity ain't gonna work. We need to understand. We have a lot of fellas that are professional growers, professional distributors, professional retail sellers. What we need to do is make it legal. We need to start with a tolerance policy so that if a youngster is caught with two marijuana sticks in his pocket, that he's let go. Instead of taken to the police station, write, written up, was probably sent home and then called back to courts and given a police record and can't get a scholarship and most probably thrown out of school. We just, just, just had an issue where they were talking about the fighting of youngsters and how, many, how, how comes so much a high in school and teachers are nervous. But if you regulate this, you can also put a decent impact there. Because like it or not, the streets will always regulate themselves. They don't need the law for that. They will regulate themselves. And when the streets realize that certain individuals are messing it up, like are they fighting too much in the neighborhoods, are they doing that? The streets will take care of that. But right now, the streets are taking care of themselves because they have to hustle. Right now, the hustle is illegal. And I'm saying legalize the hustle. The government will get their share of tax money. They'll get it. Because in Holland, they pay tax too. Marijuana is not legal in Holland. And I don't think they're going to legalize it that easy. And I hear some people talking about they're going to legalize marijuana. It ain't going to happen so easy in this kingdom because of the laws. But if you create a tolerance policy, which is much easier to start with, you can, you can, under the tolerance policy, create a policy for the growers, the distributors, and the coffee shop retailers. And you can create a smoker's license. Like they have in Totola. The tourists come in, they want to smoke something. They have something for them. But we here are pretending we must do it different than the others. And I don't understand why. For the love of money, I, I, I honestly don't understand it. But again, I will continue to fight for the tolerancy policy that it becomes accepted within the margins that are set and if you go outside of those margins you will be prosecuted yes you will be but we need to agree that if it's good in one part of the kingdom that we too should be able to have that right to do it and that we have to ensure that certain medical um, components are in place then we should do so but don't shoot it down and say yeah but they ain't got this they ain't got that but you never gave it to me you never l allowed me to do it Look at how mental health has been fighting for years to get a place. Please. We want to diversify. This is an option. This will, you know, when you legalize something, you don't have to sneak around because it's legal. I all I'm saying we need to stand up and say, okay, we want to do this. 
But we have to stand up and mean it genuinely. Because too often, we just stand up for the sake of standing up because it feels good, it looks good. And I'm saying, we got to get better than this. Uh, I hope in the future that when the king, the queen, and the president come, the, sorry, the princess comes, that they will be able to tour our marijuana plantations and see us toiling the lands side by side. No apologies needed then because it is we for we. You all have a wonderful Monday. Enjoy the rest of the King's visit today and tomorrow. Stay safe. Traffic will be a little rough because when they're moving around, they're going to close down the roads. Be a little patient and I'll see you all next week Monday. Bounces out.